A truly historical event happened today at Tata Steel Chess Masters 2023 as Magnus Carlsen lost for a second time in a row and he lost today as white pieces and yeah, such an event happens close to never. So yeah, let's take a look at this amazing game and I guarantee it's gonna blow your mind because Magnus Carlsen is being destroyed as white in his favorite territory. Hi guys, it's International Master Eugenie Lisev and today we are going to take a look at this amazing game between Magnus Carlsen and Nodjerbek Abdusadar. So, Magnus played as white and the game started with c4, c5, the English opening symmetrical variation and, well, Magnus is famous for trying to avoid the uh, opening theory uh, oftentimes and just trying to get his play where there is no theory available and he can just slowly outplay his slightly lower rated opponent. Well, in fact, the rating difference is almost 150 points between them, so you can't even say that it's a slightly, uh, slightly difference in the rating. So, uh, well, nothing special yet, and here Nodjerbek plays e5, clearly his preparation, and he tries to fight for the center immediately. If you do nothing as white, uh, then, well, even e4 sometimes is possible, but Magnus is kind of provoking it. So the main line here is d4, fighting for the center, but Magnus plays bishop e2 and basically is saying, well, you can do whatever you want, I don't care about the center, I want to just develop my pieces as fast as possible. And so that's what uh, Noderbeck does, he plays d5 here, and Magnus takes, knight takes, and just castles. Like I said, well, just trying to develop a new piece with every move, and well, in the main, uh, with the time, black is uh, getting the initiative here in the center, but well, Magnus is trying to use it. Now his development, bishop goes to b5, creating an immediate threat of knight takes e5, as the knight on c6 is pinned, and you can't really castle here because well, then I could take you and take on e5, so pawns are doubled and white has an extra pawn. So that is the idea. Knight takes c3, d takes c, and well, there is pretty much no more theoretical lines here. It's all about the practical game and well, Magnus was certainly hoping to outplay um, his opponent in such a position. Also, he lost uh, his last game to Anish Giri, so he wanted to get the momentum, he wanted to uh, get back into the tournament uh, situation and well, uh, go up in overall standings. So obviously he wanted to win this game, so he pushed as hard as he could. He played d4 here, it leads to some exchanges, but well, white is finally uh, fighting for the center, which is of course one of the most important thing in chess overall. Because, well, oftentimes most of the important events are happening in the center of the board. Now you could see that white is a little bit better developed, uh, creating some pressure and black skin is still not castled. Bishop goes to d7 and now suddenly knight goes back to f3. Well. Magnus is trying to avoid some uh, trades because if you allow your opponent to trade too many pieces, you are left with basically nothing to play for a win. So that is why knight f3, but it's, you could argue it's a little bit a passive move. You go back and, well, it doesn't create any threats, obviously. Bishop goes to f6. It's a great diagonal for the bishop. Otherwise, this bishop will go to b2 and, well, it would be white's bishop, which is going to be incredibly strong in the position. So, bishop f6 trying to stop this idea. And now, bishop goes to a3. Magnus Carlsen sacrificed an exchange trying to say that I'm gonna have those powerful bishops. Um, I'm gonna just attack you as hard as I can. And Snodderbeck says, well, do whatever you want, I'm not afraid, I'm gonna capture this exchange and just castle alongside, my king is safe and, well, you can do whatever you want. So, Magnus played rook c1, you could see that all of white pieces are active. This queen is active, this knight is also coming, maybe king b8 uh, here, uh, black plays and uh, tries to escape with the king because it's always bad to have your queen on the same diagonal as your opponent's rook, but it's even worse when your king stands on the same line, so he tries to escape uh, of those pins. Now, queen takes g7, 
Magnus tries to get some material back. Now the queen is very active and also the pawn is taken. Rook g8, but well, the drawback is that now this rook is incredibly good for black along this g file, uh, putting some pressure on white's king. Queen went back to b2, yeah, maybe trying to say, well, now this queen is active along the b file, and for example, if the queen goes somewhere, then this piece could be uh, wind by, could be taken by white thanks to the spin of the b pawn. And bishop goes to g4, but well, the idea here is that if you take on c6, I can sacrifice the queen and you can't take it because of the back rank issues. So basically, yes, you can grab the piece, but tactically it doesn't work because you don't have any space for your king. That is why Magnus played knight e1 and now actually uh, bishop takes c6 is a threat because there is no uh, checkmate in the end, so that would be winning a whole piece. But Nodirbeck plays rook d1, not allowing uh, this, uh, once again, tactically, this opportunity. And well, he makes sure, so if you take here, I could just take it first, threaten a checkmate in one, so you have no way to stop it except for queen takes c1, but then there is no pin along the b file and black could just capture this bishop back. So that is why Magnus exchanged the rooks here, but it only helps black because well, if you look at Black's position, it's an exchange up, and the more pieces uh, you trade, the simpler it is to deal with your opponent's threats and then start converting your advantage. The general rule is, if you have the material advantage, try to exchange as many pieces as possible. Okay, so Bishop went back to F1, trying to stabilize a little bit, but it's already a move back and you can feel that, well, it's not really going Magnus's way and the engine also confirms it with the evaluation in Black's favor. Knight goes to e5, yeah, an active move, engine doesn't really like it, but, well, who cares, it's all about the practical game. This knight is very active in the center of the board, creating a lot of difficulties for Black. Let's see what happened, Magnus played h3, finally trying to create some space for the skin. Bishop f3, slightly artificial move because, well, the knight can capture it, but uh, it doesn't work because of checkmate in two, the knight will take back and then you can't take back this pawn, king goes to h1, the only move, and then queen h2 checkmate. But the problem is this move doesn't really create any threats, like if I'm not taking it, what are you threatening? This pawn on g2 is protected a lot of times and it's not clear what's the point. But Magnus plays here queen d4, which is not really that great either, so in such a practical game when the position is so sharp, it's so simple to make a mistake. Even this incredibly strong uh, Grandmaster, uh, Grandmasters and World Champions, well, they can't really uh, find all of the best moves because the position is so rich, so many different opportunities for both sides. Black played Rook D8, trying to attack this Rook, get the, I mean, attack this Queen with the Rook and get the uh, open uh, D file. But of course, you could be, you should be careful now because uh, this Bishop is under attack as the G pawn is not uh, pinned anymore. Queen went to H4 and now Bishop back to D5. You could say that overall Black is more active and also. Well, just an exchange up for a pawn, so Magnus tries to get another pawn, now it's 5 against 3, so uh, he has enough uh, material to compensate the exchange, but uh, Black's pieces are now more active. Bishop c4, trying to exchange more pieces, because then, well, the white king would be vulnerable uh, along the back rank. Bishop takes, king takes, and now queen to c4 uh, check, creating the first problem. King goes back to g1, knight c6, sidestepping all of the problems. Now this bishop is powerful, of course, but well, it doesn't create any difficulties for black. In such a position, it's objectively equal, it's equal in terms of the material, but it's so much more difficult to play as white because, well, black skin is secure and uh, it's very simple to black to create some threats for white. and. For white, you should be very, very careful, careful with everything, and maybe you should try to create your own counterplay, but it's connected with many risks, so practically it's all in uh, Black's favor. Knight goes to f3, kind of stabilizing everything, because now rook d1 is not a problem, the king has a secure spot on h2. 
Queen takes a2, black is just taking another pawn and now, well, preparing some ideas for the future that this a pawn could move. The b pawn is not that great to move because that opens the king a lot and expose it to some checks. Bishop went to f6 with the tempo, rook d1 check and a5. So this pawn starts its uh, push towards the a1 square. Of course, a1 is covered, but well, once it's on a2, it's gonna be incredibly dangerous and incredibly difficult for white to stop it. Knight went to d4, Magnus tries to exchange those knights, queen goes to d5, stabilizing the situation. Now the queen is on the center and well, that's the best position for the queen because it controls so many squares. So in the end game, always try to put your queen in the center of the board. Queen went to c2, also well, making sure that nothing wrong happens here, uh, keeping an eye on this a4 square and of course attacking the rook on d1. Queen d6 check, and it's not that simple to cover this check because the king has no uh, squares to go. If you play g3, then just bishop takes f6, and the problem is, yes, rook is uh, more important than the, the bishop, but the f2 pawn is also hanging. And afterwards, well, all of those pawns are just a disaster. Also, well, black could start here with knight takes d4, just going into the, this queen's end game, bit, uh, sorry, into this queen's uh, end game, and well, there black is much better, and it's only black who can play for a win, and objectively the position is just winning for black. So. Magnus played here f4, which is objectively the best move and probably the only move to fight here. And here you can't really take the bishop, because then just queen takes d1, uh, probably uh, first knight takes e6, but any, anyways, just queen takes d1, and now, well, the material is roughly equal, and the king is more or less solid here on h2. So, instead, Abdusadorov plays rook takes d4, sacrificing this exchange back and going into the endgame, which is much better for black, especially in, in terms of practical position. Bishop takes, knight takes, pawn takes, and queen takes f4, check, g3, and queen takes d4, so if you count the pawns, it would be 3 against 2, and, well, black has much more potential to create some uh, promotions here as white. h4, of course, Magnus needs to create some counterplay, otherwise you can never survive in such a position. But a4, the spawn is a little bit faster. Queen a2, Magnus tries to stop it and also keeping an eye on this f7 pawn. But of course, the a pawn is the most important one. f5, well, uh, black is trying to create some problems for the skin because if you have a lot of checks for the king, it's always very annoying. And as black, it's always very, a very good thing to have. H5, well, Magnus is trying to promote his pawn, no matter what. Queen H8, now sacrificing this pawn, but uh, Magnus, uh, as Magnus took it, Queen takes H5, now white has no counterplay whatsoever, no passers, and black still has this B pawn, which could potentially run. Of course, it's not a simple task, because in the Queen's uh, endgame, it's all about the King's position, because if you have a Perpetual check, it's always a draw, so black needs to be incredibly careful, but it's a very pleasant situation to find yourself, especially in a game against Magnus Carlsen, because you can never lose in such a position, and the question is only whether you can convert it or not. So king went to g1, queen f3, now the queen is controlling basically everything and also attacks the spawn on g3. So king went back to h2, queen a2 check, king g1, and now queen e5, remember what I told you about the queen's position, center is always the best thing because you're controlling here so many different things. And comparing, comparing to the corner, you don't really uh, control that many squares. So now b5 is ready because once again it's protected and there are no checks. You can never exchange the queens in such a position because king's uh, endgame with an extra pawn is always winning. So white should just try to block the pawn and give as many checks as possible and ho hope for the best, basically. King went to b7 and g4. So this pawn is exchanged and now it's all about this pawn, whether black can promote it or not, whether white can give a perpetual check. 
So let's see what happened uh, next. King went to b6. Of course, well, um, black is trying to run uh, with the king together and then using this pawn kind of as a shield and just pushing forward and forward. Queen g8, b4, king f3. It's not even simple to give a check with white. Like you play queen d8, the king will just go forward or queen g6 and then, like I said, it's gonna hide behind the pawn and help it to promote. King f3, uh, king b5, and you can see that evaluation is now tremendously uh, big for in, in black's favor. Of course, objectively, at some point it was a draw, but well, we are not gonna run into the thousands of different variations because it's like a 40 move variation where you have to make a great number of right moves to make this draw possible in a practical game. It's extremely difficult and uh, as it turns out, an impossible task even for the world champion. King went to g2, so the general rule is to have your king as far as possible from the actions, because then you can just give a lot of checks with your queen, not worried, uh, worrying about the fact that your opponent could exchange the queens. So that is what Magnus is trying to do. A few checks and now b3, once again the queen is controlling everything and uh, king is ready to support. Queen b8, Magnus is starting uh, giving some checks, but the king is trying to hide uh, there behind the point, uh, the pawn behind the queen, and well, using the fact that at some point uh, black could threaten some queen's exchange. And of course, once the queens are off the board, the game is immediately over. Queen h8, now white is trying to stop this b2, mo uh, b2 move, saying that, well, you can't promote, and if you help with your king, I'm gonna start giving checks again. But the problem is, it doesn't really work that way, because here, queen to d2, check, king went to g3, and now b2, black is threatening this b1 promotion, so queen a, uh, to h7, trying to, and to stop it, king went to c1, uh, to c1 trying to support this b, uh, b1 promotion, queen went to c7 with a check, queen c2, uh, queen f4, check, now king to d1, no wait, it can be, it can be right. B2 now threatening to promote as a pawn and Magnus resigned here just yeah, out of desperation, not uh, seeing any way to, to stop the promotion. You can play queen h7 and actually I would play a few more moves here with white because black still needs to prove how um, he's gonna win. Because, well, king c1, for example, the most obvious way to continue runs into queen c7. And if you go queen c2, once again, a logical move, then queen to f4 and, well, you have to go back to d2 because otherwise this position, for example, is already a draw because there is no way to escape the checks now. But of course, for a super grandmaster, it's not that difficult. Uh, here, queen to d6 can be played, and when the king goes somewhere, now king c1, because queen h1 is not an opportunity, there is queen d1, and that would be a queen sec change, and then the pawn would be promoted, and otherwise you don't have any checks because h6 square is also covered, so yeah, there is no way to stop the b1 move and then uh, this, this queen d6 is a key here because it's cementing everything, it's making sure that there are no checks possible, there is no way to stop b1 and of course with two queens now black easily wins the game. So Magnus Carlsen losing for the second time in a row, a historical event that it's still only around five of, of Tata Steel Masters 2023. So I'm very excited to see what uh, what is gonna happen next. How Magnus will be able to recover from it? Will he just start to crush his his opponents to come back, or would he continue losing all of the games? And well, we will see a tragedy for the current world chess champion. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel if you want to get even more educational and entertaining videos and see you in the next one.